I'm going to talk about is up there, does it matter who's supervising and mentoring black students? And I have a subtitle on finding a mentor who's going to help you do meaningful work. So let me get started. Have you ever reflected on the process you and others undertake in finding a supervisor or a mentor? And while at it, it, what is one wish? What do you wish one thing? a supervisor or a mentor could have told you at an early point in your postgraduate studies or when you started to work, early career, towards this meaningful work or more useful work or more interesting work. A while ago I started to think about uh, both these questions together with my students uh, some of whom are here, and interns, um, and I thought, let me put a handful of, of key ideas about this, these questions and related ones on how I would have, or how one goes about finding and doing meaningful, m meaningful work, and finding a supervisor who, who urges, urges you towards that end. Because finding a good mentor is a necessary part of finding and getting to, to doing meaningful work, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, a supervisor and a mentor sometimes are one person. Um, other times you have to find a mentor because a supervisor is, is like an absent father. I do, I do father work, so that's a good metaphor. Uh, just barely there. So I've been thinking of this for some time now. Uh, I'm a slow thinker. Uh, happily, slow thinking is a thing now, so um, I'm okay with that. Once in a while, I do mention I do mention uh, one or other ideas to my students. I don't know whether they hear me because it, it can be a long while for somebody just to register. When, when you're in these relationships, uh, when we are talking about their work. But I've never presented this, these thoughts in a public forum, so, uh, and I never thought to write them down and make it into a presentation. Uh, so here they are. So you can weigh them, adjudicate on them, add to them, cut them down, but hopefully make them better. Three ideas. There are many, but I'm going to reduce them to three. First, first have a POV, a point of view. Most of us the students are taught to read, which is a really important thing, to review, but also to regurgitate what everyone else from Aristotle to Plato to Durkheim, Freud, the psychologist here, Marx, Simone de Beauvoir, and if you're lucky, if you're lucky, Nezizua has touched on this, if you're lucky, you, accept it, you are expected to say what a sojourner truth or laguma who used to live around these parts, or a W. B. Dubois or Chabani Mangani or even Sheikh Anta Diop has said. Now, that's fine. Reading and reviewing and immersing yourself in the literature and the history of your area of work is important. You have to be in it to be part of it. But what you don't get told is you need to develop from get-go a point of view. And the thing is, if you are not told this, you start chasing some fads. It's chasing uh, instant gratification, as it were, and associating celebrity intellectuals, whether it's a Foucault, or Freud, Freud was a celebrity by the way, or a Freud, or institutions without fully developing your own voice within this larger tradition. So here is this again, you have to develop 
as a student a point of view. It's a hard thing to do, to develop a voice when there are all these major voices, whether it's in, th in, in, in professional practice, but to develop somebody when they tell you that CBT is the thing or psychoanalysis, to develop something is so hard about your own practice. So have the courage to experiment and nourish it and hopefully your mentor will nourish it and don't be afraid to express it. Have balls, again, I'm masculinity. Have balls, but I didn't say this, as you'll hear. This is a very smart, very ballsy Ugandan intellectual and activist Stella Nyanzi said to me when I spoke to, to her a while back. And she knows a thing or two about having balls. She is fighting every day with the president of Uganda uh, on social media and in person. Uh, and have the guts to be wrong, to be amazing. Like young Jeezy who was listening to this morning. I listened to young Jeezy about a song with Kanye West called Amazing. I like that song. So then, seek a mentor or supervisors who will nurture your voice, your point of view, your perspective, your fullness. Two, create. It sounds easy, but creating work beyond the class, beyond the classroom, beyond the supervisor in you is, is not something that is expected in many disciplines. In some disciplines, uh, not so much in psychology, which I was trained in, not in public health, not in geography and others. And the work doesn't have to be of the scale of Yayoi Kusama, the Japanese artist. And with luck, if you do create something wonderful and big, it might be presented, if you are in art, for instance, the Venice Biennale, but that's not why you create. Uh, so whether you're in social work or criminology or psychology, politics, medical anthropology, transport economics, women's studies, just make something. And the, the thing is, in these times, thanks to new media, you can easily create something, you create a website, a blog. As you know, technology is a, is a funny thing, particularly Google. You can't get something that's not being put in, into, the, into the ether. So if you Google Shabville, Shabville this week, if you Google Shabville, guess what comes first? 1960, 21 March comes first. So all the life around Shabville rot rotates around this one moment because people in Shabville are not putting into that that actually Shabville is more than this really important moment. Same thing with psychology. If you don't put African psychology or African-centered knowledge, you don't get it out. So create. Uh, and it's so much better if what you create is a 3D something. And I'm, I'm on about this 3D something because but by that I mean something that, that is not only text. Writing papers is really important if you're an academic. Writing a model of doing therapy is important. But if you can create something that lives outside of the paper, something concrete that can stand the passing of time. And I'm struck by this because at least once a year, uh, not, you know, when I travel, there's one thing they say, so you know, when people invite me, they say, so what do you want to do in your spare time? Say, well, I'd like to go to a museum, I'd like to go to where there's art. And it is a wonderful thing to realize that the countries that are supposed to be individualists, the highly developed countries, always commemorate tradition. They always put sculptures outside, commemorating something. They're creating this. This is a creation that, that lives on outside of the art class. So you can create a website, a blog, even a Facebook page, or you can establish a student division of your professional association if you are in a profession. You can develop a public engagement project. You can found a reading group, which has been great in South Africa in the last two years or so, uh, this revival of reading groups. So whatever it is, create it, see what meaning you get from from it plenty, and if you have a supervisor who encourages that, that you have to create. Uh, it also makes it uh, you interesting to talk to at parties, of course, besides the usual conference bit. So don't be afraid to fail. If you are not failing, 
chances are, as people say, you are sleeping. If you're not creating in whatever discipline you are, if you're doing the same thing again and again, reading the same authors over and over, writing the same paragraph in so many different ways, your chances are failing. You are close to zero. You are not creating anything. You're repeating what people are saying, basically. You're repeating what you yourself are saying. The more you challenge yourself, the more likely you're going to fail. So expect failure, go ahead, create. The take home message is this, as far as I can see. You find a supervisor who helps you to think about creating, who will help you become a creator beyond the class, who will challenge you and catch you just when you're about to fall. Last, collaborate. It's amazing how long it has taken me to understand why collaboration is important. And I have been doing this professor thing since I was 34. But just to get it, why is collaborating? And I, I haven't quite let go of doing something on my own because the system, the innovation system we're part of is full of tension. And I'm part of that system. I chair the National Research Foundation Psychology Panel on Ratings. And what it does is, is the system tells you that to collaborate. They say collaborate so that we can give you funding. But when we rate you, we look at the thing that you wrote on your own. So there's this tension that works all the time, that confuses you. So whatever my views of being part of the beast that is the National Research Foundation and the National Innovation System, I am panting collaboration. Collaboration does something to your own work, to your own thinking. So here it is. Find interesting people. Find interesting mentors to start with. Uh, interesting people generally, fellow students if you're a student, if you're a young researcher or an older one, and persuade them about how interesting you are. And of course, you would have developed a point of view. That's why you're interesting. Ask to, to collaborate or just be around. Be willing to do behind the work, the scenes work from which you can learn. Seek support from willing and experienced scholars. Not every one of us uh, is an old academic fart. Make a nuisance of yourself. The lone rage type of work that I just spoke about. Writing a paper. And some disciplines encourage this. History is one of them. Psychology to some extent, that you write alone. You sit in your office and you write alone. And one of the more proud, it's not out yet, paper that I just did with my students, six of them, five, six of them, is this idea that you got to find other people who say something different to yours and try to bring it together. Of course you can do it with your supervisor only, but if you move beyond that, it's even more interesting. So this lone rage type of research is not just helping when a society like ours uh, can, could use large multidisciplinary teams that can tackle real world problems and come up with new products. You can't solve the problem of a city many, for instance, if you're a psychologist, if you're just writing one paper. It's a systemic problem. It needs work at different levels. You can't solve the problem of violence in South Africa if you work alone. You can write however great the paper you do, violence, cannot be solved by one academic sitting in their office at UWC or at the Medical Research Council. You have to work in large teams because the problem is a policy one, it's a structural one, it's a symbolic one, it's an interpersonal one, it's a gendered one. The death stalks us in this country and to solve the problem of preventable death, it takes a lot of collaborating. But also, this problem of lone rager type research, or which psychologists, clinical psychologists, one-to-one, -one, it produces loneliness, actually. It produces a tiresome competition. So be part of something large. Don't isolate yourself. Do dope stuff like you Kanye West, that's what he says. Be a good teacher also to others. If you are in postgraduate studies, you start to learn to be a teacher. Be a teacher, it doesn't have to be in a class, but peer teaching sometimes is the most important. You see it with kids. They learn, at a certain point, start to learn beyond their mothers and their fathers. And that stuff sticks. 
that they learn and they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas and as a parent you say no no actually that doesn't work but they're learning they're telling you about learning from other people and so as you advance you pull someone up uh, so the take home here is if you're a supervisor or mentor you have to draw students in collaborate collab collaborations if you're a student ask for this you have to ask for this you have to be part of a larger group so that other people can hear can hear uh, so the, you as a student can hear other voices. I want to conclude in a, a few paragraphs. I want to state that some of this stuff uh, that I've reduced to three things, collaborate, create, develop a point of view, are not mine alone, but a collection of feelings and thoughts from friends and colleagues I'm through that incredibly that incredible and incredibly strange universe called Facebook, but also personally, who responded to a post of mine a while back. Some of them are here, thanks to Umesh, uh, Stella I mentioned, Bukhle Zoto, Kerry, Joanne, Raylene, and everyone else that I'm not mentioning, just interacting and talking to people about what do you do? What would you have liked to, to have done? And I've reduced to some of these points. I should say also that these ideas, I would have liked to have them offered when I started my university education and certainly my postgraduate studies and even when I started working here 22 years ago now when I started working here that if you can find a group that nourishes your point of view you are on your way and if you can collaborate with them and unlucky for me I found myself in a group of feminists and I've never known what to do with my hands ever since um, and these people these groups and the people you find uh, will point you towards the difference between doing meaningful work and important work. Meaningful work and useful work. Meaningful work and what most students end up doing, interesting work. Look, I'm not saying when you're doing an analysis of men's health about clothes is not interesting. It is interesting, but is it really meaningful? You have to find somebody who points you to that direction. And by the way, I have done that work, analyzing newspapers. This is, we need this. It's a symbolic part of what we do. So I wish I'd, I'd realized how I could have used someone back then who pushed me to develop my own voice. They did, but more and more, that your voice is important. Your voice is necessary. And to create things and to point out how vital collaboration is. But this is not about regret, by the way. There is immense joy in overcoming, uh, in resilience, in being a self-made woman or man, or other gendered subject. However, the value of a good mentor, as far as I can see, or a good supervisor, indeed a great teacher for black students in a place like this, in a country like this, is immeasurable, especially at any points in one's educational career. A good mentor may also be applicable when one is at the beginning of a career as a therapist, as a social worker, as a researcher, or anything you can think, think about. Uh, these then are just three ideas I could have used when as a black boy with promise, I started out in my university studies and suddenly when I started as a researcher, who knows, I could have been the Quincy Jones of masculinity studies. And I hope they are of some help to you. Thank you.